Hi, I'm Frances Katzen and welcome to my podcast, The World of Real Estate. In this series, we will explore the world's largest asset class and how it plays out on a global scale. I am very excited to welcome to the show a longtime friend of mine, starting back when we were both beginning in real estate. <laughs> God. He toppled biases and powered through endless adversity with pure grit, hard work, dedication, and drive. You may have known him from Million Dollar Listing New York. You may have known him as one of the halves of Eklund and Gomes' team at Douglas Elliman. John Gomes, I'm really happy you are joining me today. Since our early days, you've transformed into a complete force of nature to be reckoned with. A total boss broker. Let's wind it back to the very beginning, but welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. John, where did you grow up? Boston. What? Yes. Really? Yes, really. Where in Boston? Uh, Norwood, which is about 20 minutes outside of the city. What was that like? Uh, very different than New York. <laughs> <laughs> Safe answer. What was it like? <laughs> Rough? It's a pretty loaded question uh, because it was, um, it was a very different life than the one that I'm living today. Yes. Uh, I came from a very simple family, really hardworking parents, working class multiple jobs, struggling to put food on the table, uh, that sort of situation. So in that regard, it was rough. That being said, I was provided for, I did have a good education, I was dressed, you know, it's not like there's a lot worse situations, I think, in the world that we live in today. So, but it was a lot different than the life that I live now. So in that regard, it was rough, but I was young, so it didn't really, I didn't have anything to compare it to. Where are your parents from? My mom is from New York City. She was born on the Upper East Side. Uh, my grandmother at the time thought that New York City was no place to raise a family, so when they had their first child, they left New York and moved to Boston. Why Boston, though? Uh, you know, my grandfather was Irish, and there was a very big Irish community, uh -huh, and there still is the a very eyes. big uh -huh, uh -huh. Irish community there. So, uh, And my dad is from the Cape Verde Islands, little-known uh -huh. country to many people. Uh, it was a colony of Portugal until they gained independence in 1976. And uh, its location is just a stone's throw from Senegal, Africa. It's really part of the African continent, but it was a colony of, uh, of Portugal. So it has that sort of melange of like, um, you know, European and African and everything else thrown in there which is a really interesting culture. I'm sure, and I'm sure you got exposed to all of that. So he's black, by the way. Okay, got it. I got that after you said that. I'm like, right. so, <laughs> Note to self, got it. Yes. What were their professions? My dad was a truck driver, a really hard-working, wake up early in the morning, get your hands dirty. So he was driving. out of the house before you woke up? out of the house before I woke up. Um, and Did he do long-distance drives? He didn't do long distance drives. It's just that he worked multiple jobs. So it's almost as if he did in the sense that he was gone all the time. Ooh. You know, he'd leave early in the morning and sometimes he'd come back so late at night that I wasn't even awake still. Wow. Yeah. Did you catch up on weekends? Not really. No. And, you know, I had a really strained relationship with my dad when I was young, quite frankly. And, you know, he was really just focused on working. And, and quite frankly, it wasn't because he loved to work. It was because he had to work. You know, he came from a third world country. He had no education. When he came to this country, I remember him telling me the story. He was, um, gosh, I think he was like... 13 years old and they put him into a second grade classroom because he didn't speak English. Oh. Right. Yeah. So he didn't really have much of an educational background. As a result, didn't have many opportunities. Now, wow, that's a whole bowl of wax right there. Yeah. How many of you are in the house? Well, so... Um, <laughs> You're one of how many? <laughs> it changed over time. I bet. Um, in some regards, I'm the first child. However, my dad had a previous marriage and had two children from that marriage. Got so it. at various times, they came and they went. So it was me until it wasn't just me anymore. And then my brother, who was born in the Cape Verde Islands, later came. And then he grew up with us from the moment that he arrived until. So then suddenly I became, you know, the second child until my sister was born, who's six years younger than me. And then I became the middle child. And then oftentimes in the summer, my sister from Ohio would visit, which is my half-sister. So technically speaking, Whoa. yeah, there are two half-siblings siblings that I know about 
and Jesus. I have one other sibling with my same two parents. How did that feel? You know, it's confusing. Funny. Yeah, in a way, look, it, it wasn't so difficult for me because I really did live in my own world, and um, you know, there was a lot of noise going on around me when I was growing up. Lots of things were going on, mm -hmm. uh, and I just sort of created my own world that I lived in. So it, it really, it was not really such a big issue. True survivor mentality. Correct. How would you describe yourself? How would I describe ha, myself? A million That's a dollar question. question. No pun intended. Um, you know, a good human. Mm. My mom, she well always said. said to me, and does the advice she gave me when, when I had my own children, she said, it's very simple, John. Let me give you this advice as a parent. Um, you should have one simple goal in life. That's what I had, she said. And it was to raise a good boy. And she said, I was successful at that. And she said, you know how? I said, how? She said, anything that went wrong, I just poured love on the problem. So all you have to do is love. The more that you love, the more that your child will love you and the more of a beautiful life and life experience that child will have. And that child will be raised to be a good human. And that's, uh, that's how I describe myself. When did you know you were gay? Oh, gosh. It was never one of those things I often hear of people, or hear people, rather, talking about, you know, I came out. or I don't have a coming out story. I was born gay. And, you know, thankfully, my parents recognized that at a very early age. And they just allowed me to be. Um, you know, there was a turning point, actually. It was Christmas one year where my dad actually um, said, OK, I'm leading into this. And I woke up one morning, and under the tree was the Barbie cottage, the Barbie Corvette, <laughs> the Barbie and the Ken. I was getting only Ken stuff for, for so many years. and But I was using my You've good friend, over. Heather Kirchwa. I was using her you know, Barbie dolls all the time, because the truth is I really wanted the hair. I used to dye the hair with shoe <laughs> polish uh, and cut it like the Eurythmics. I mean, I used to go all out. I loved any yeah. looks and hair styles. <laughs> How did you come to terms with your sexuality and how did you feel about that growing up? Because although you didn't have a coming out, there must have been a moment where you weren't, I mean, your parents got that you liked the Barbie, but when do you make that known? Yeah, look, I was fortunate enough as well to grow up in a town uh, where the, you know, the first two men ever went to a prom together. Um, they wow. used to say about the town that I lived in, you know, don't drink that water. Uh, <laughs> Back then, things were a little bit different. Uh, but it wasn't really, I never really, I didn't have a hard time coming out. I Like, being gay was never such a difficult <laughs> thing. I mean, look, I was harassed by people sometimes. People did poke fun at me. I used to play hopscotch with the girls. <laughs> I had more girlfriends than I had boyfriends. But truthfully, it was never that big of a problem because I just was very comfortable in my own skin. You know, my parents, I have to thank for that, I think. Um, that it didn't really, I didn't let it bother me. I just okay. didn't sweat it. Lucky you. I am very fortunate very. and one of the few, yeah. Okay, so now you're in New York, you arrive. How big was your first place? Oh gosh. My first place, if I had to guess the amount of square footage in that two bedroom apartment, <laughs> um, look, it Gina was, Ken? I just have to tell you though, it was, to die for location. I love you. Only you could sell it, right? <laughs> I was just telling I mean, you, like, like, no, 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 no. Like, just I, look at that. I still look back at it. It was, I'm telling you, it was 605 Hudson Street. Oh, great location. And that's Hudson yeah, between okay. 12th yeah. and Bethune. <laughs> and I fronted on the park, you know, Abington Square. Yeah. And it was, like, the best location that you can ever imagine. However, let me tell you that there were two bedrooms. What? And I was a third roommate. <laughs> so I didn't have a bedroom. Wow. That's the truth. Okay. I had a full-size bed and a big Dalmatian dog that I showed up with. And my bedroom was actually the living room. So it was probably like a thousand square foot, if it was maybe 900 square foot apartment. <laughs> but I was living with my dog uh, in the living room. Right. And who were the roommates? Uh, there were two people that I knew from going out to nightclubs. Okay. sort of why I ended up in New York, because I was in to the club scene so there were friends of friends that I had met through the club scene how long were you there 
I was there for, gosh, I think probably six months. I overstayed mm -hmm. my welcome. <laughs> uh, by the time I left, they were like, get out. <laughs> um, but I, once again, got lucky. And I was able to move to 59 West 10th Street. Only, and I lived on 10th six. Street between 5th and 6th. I just oh miraculously gosh. found a rent stabilized apartment and was paying Seriously? maybe like sixteen hundred dollars a month for a two bedroom. Wow. It was a three I was on the third floor, it was a five story walk up, but I was on tenth street between fifth and sixth. Uh, and let me tell you, I stayed there for a long time. Good man. Smart. <laughs> what was your goal and when you arrived in New York? What was the goal for you? Well, I was trying to get away from going to law school, to be honest. Uh <laughs> <laughs> My goal is to not go to law school. I came to New York. I was working as a paralegal. Get um, out of here. I was in a pre-law curriculum Cannot in undergrad, even see you like double that. major, <laughs> communication studies, political science, all of that. And I decided that I want to go to law school, took the LSATs, went through the whole process, and then got cold feet. And I just thought, God, there's just something that I don't know. I just, I wasn't feeling it. I was just very anxious and apprehensive. So I had to craft a plan out of that. And um, so I decided that I would come to New York City and work with a top 10 law firm. That was Nixon, Hargrave, Devins, and Doyle at the time. Uh, <laughs> it was a yeah. Madison Avenue firm. I, I Yeah, I'm telling you. And I couldn't get a job as a paralegal at first. I had to go into the mailroom. I was like, <laughs> I'll take it because you know wow. what? I'm going to get out of the mailroom and I'm going to get a job as a paralegal. Unbelievable. So I went into the mailroom and I left the mailroom and I became a paralegal. <laughs> and after a year of doing that, I realized I could not do that for one more day. And that was the end. <laughs> so <laughs> that okay. was what I planned to do when I came to New York. <laughs> so, so after you realized that was a no go, then can I ask you, and I backtrack now a little bit, what were the ambitions growing up? Oh, God. You know, growing up, I used to have these shows all the time. Um, I was a choreographer, a dancer, a singer. I wasn't really good at any of these things, quite frankly. Mm. But uh, And I had no sort of training. However, I had this something inside of me. Uh, I used to turn on a light and actually... Uh, shine the light in my direction and just stand in front of it and perform. And I took it from my basement to the street and I would get friends to become actors and performers with me and we would find any audience that we could anywhere and we would have these shows. So I guess I thought somehow uh, I was meant to be a performer, maybe um, uh, on the Broadway stage or something in, in, in the big lights. It's what I sort of always thought I wanted to do. And I tried to do that when I Did got you? to New York. Um, for a short time, I didn't really give it, you know, as much attention as it needed. Uh, and so as a result, I, I didn't, yeah, I was not successful at that. But I, there's still a part of me that wonders, like, is that what I was supposed to do? Sort of a thing. I could see you doing really well with yeah. it, by the way. I could. What was your first job after the law firm? The next job after the law firm, uh, well, okay, so I went to business school. After the after the um, the law school thing, uh, I <laughs> my exit interview with one of my attorneys that I worked very closely with. She said, "You know, I really would not recommend that you go to law school." I said, "I hear you loud and clear." She did say, "However, John, I think that you should consider business school." And I just thought to myself, why would I ever go to business school? I hate math. I'm not good at accounting and those sort of things. Anyway, after giving it much thought and a friend of mine going to business school, she thought I would be good for it. Anyway, long story short, I applied and got accepted to business school. So I did my MBA after I left Where? the law firm at Baruch. Unbelievable. Yeah. So I did my MBA did here in like New York. It? I loved it. I excelled. I was the... Uh, let's see. My first year of business school, I was the vice president of the student council. Of My second were. year, I was the president of the of student council. You were, John. I graduated cum laude and like the whole nine yards. I'm, I'm a very big part of that community till today. So, yeah. how do you go from that to being the maitre d' at Baltazar? So, I was the maitre d'. I was working in the restaurant business at the same time. So, when I left, it. when I left the law firm. I had this great idea to become an actor, waiter, slash, okay. you know, all that. That's how I ended up at Balthazar, uh, which is also an interesting story because I had no experience at all 
being a waiter. But I, I had mean, a lot you of you had friends. a smile and you make people feel like a million bucks. Uh, I had a lot of friends <laughs> who had it, you know, given me good advice. And anyway, long story short, I ended up landing the job at Balthazar, which was the Big opportunity job. of a lifetime. Yep. I worked there for seven years. I started out as a waiter, I became a manager and ended as a maitre d'. It was a great experience working with Keith McNally Keith. and learning from him and He's it was great. just a uh, I just look back on those years. I have many of my really close good friends or friends that I met from that yep. period in my life. And then we all met you when you segued into real estate yes. with Evolve. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did segue into real estate because, and by the way, in between, um, I graduated from business school and felt like I could do anything in business and, you know, had that like, I can, I'm an yeah. entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, and I started a fashion company very accidentally. It's a very long story, but it was this fashion company. I acquired the label to a designer that was very successful many years ago. His name was Norman Norell. Um, and it was a very successful kickoff. Um, you know, we had this amazing fashion show, got all this press that came. It was a lot of fanfare. And our second season was the biggest flop ever. And Why? <laughs> we just kind of didn't get the design right. And uh, it just wasn't what people wanted to buy and as a matter of fact nobody bought it and I didn't have any more money to pump into it and that's basically how I segued into real estate because I was still working at Balthazar and Michael Chaveau yes. um, who at the time was the top broker in New York City came because he was my client at Balthazar and he was harassing me all the time you got to come work for me I was like why would I ever leave this cushy job here I'm making a hundred thousand dollars a year I'm like never I'm like why would I leave that and he just kept pushing and he said you know I'll make you a millionaire. And I was like, yeah, right, okay. It was so far removed from what I could even think of. But anyway, long story short, as it goes, I left and went into real estate that way. <laughs> and there we were, the <laughs> rentals. And there we were. Oh, by the way, that's another thing I have to say. Um, I wanted to come. Michael was leaving the firm the day that I was arriving at the firm. I was supposed to go to That's the right. corporate headquarters, right? So 575 Madison Avenue. That was where I was going. I had lofty goals. I knew what I wanted and I knew where I needed to be. And it didn't work out that way. So I ended up going to the rental office, which I had no interest in whatsoever because I'm going to be a big sales broker. I'm not going into rentals. And so I remember showing up there in that office and, you know, people trying to, you know, help me out or maybe befriend me. And I remember very clearly saying look let's like cut to the chase I'm here temporarily uh, there's no need to like you know go through the pleasantries because you know I'm one day gonna you're gonna show up and I'm gonna be gone <laughs> and anyway there it was three months later I was at the corporate headquarters <laughs> I had my desk and the rest was history <laughs> how did you get people to take you seriously early in your career you know I think Early in my career, I just knew I didn't have a lot of knowledge or experience. However, um, I've always been very data centric. I've always been able to do research and how I got people to listen to me is ultimately to have to, to have information. Right. I just knew. And, and also I Me come too. from a communication mm -hmm. background and I know how to communicate effectively and I know the pitfalls of communication. So I'm good at conversation and I know how to engage people. And I just learned very early on to be myself, to be the unique person that I am. There's, you know, I think people are interested in learning something new. And I think if you just kind of lean into who you are and if you're honest and if you have the information that you need, whatever your profession is, that will get people to listen to you. That is how you arrest people. I completely agree. Yeah. Can you speak to me a little bit about how it came to be for you and when Frederick entered the picture? Yeah, so I was selling... Um, a lot of new developments early on. It was the just Onyx? the Onyx. Oh my God. It was the Onyx oh Chelsea, which was Frederick's first building With ever. Cool. Yeah. And I remember that. That was the building. And I sold two units there. Colin Cowie bought them. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of selling two units at the Onyx, Frederick and Sean of Core invited me to a luncheon at what used to be the Four Seasons restaurant in Midtown. Love that. And it was very fancy. I've never been anywhere like that before. And we had really great conversation. And, you know, it led to an interview. 
uh, with Sean. And I'll never forget sitting there. Um, you know, Sean Osher said to me, you have what it takes to be a star, John Gomes. And he paused. And then he looked at me and his eyes sparkled. And he said, and I'm going to make you a star. And I was mesmerized in the moment. I mean, really, it was like a mesmerizing moment. And I believed him. And to his credit, he did. He did. He gave me this wonderful opportunity to be a part of a show that was called Selling New York. Um, it was on HGTV, and it was a great platform for me. Um, it gave me a visibility. It gave me confidence. Um, he also provided a backdrop in that firm that gave us an opportunity to learn and to grow and to have good experiences. So I, I, I give Sean Osher a lot of credit. He's great. How did you evolve? Who decided it was time to take it to the next level? Uh, in my business with Eklund Gomes? Yeah. Uh, so Frederick and I were just these, you know, we're two brokers who were just working really hard, taking anything we could get, selling anything to anyone. We just had a real passion uh, for it. Um, we, you know, early on had some great success and we just kept building on that and building on that and building on it. And the more that we built on it, um, the busier that we became, the more difficult it became to actually do it ourselves. So we had to hire an assistant to help us. We had to hire a new agent to help us, you know, and slowly but surely, we didn't even realize it, it wasn't our intention, but we were forming what became a team. And it was a small team, you know, you know, four people, five people, six people, it started to grow. And then Element has limits on these teams, 10 people. So we were always sort of trying Pushing. to stay under 10. Mm -hmm. And then one day we just said, you know what? Like, what are we wanting to stay under 10 for? This is so silly. We are busy and have so much business. So we will continue to grow. And then coming from business school, I did, you know, get the skills, I think, to learn how to run a business and to grow a business and to expand that business and so on and so forth. So it was always in my mind that I wanted to expand and grow. And one day I woke up frustrated and scared, really scared, Why? because I realized that although I'm good at what I do and I love what I do, I could only ever do it in one city in the world. And that really made me very uncomfortable really uncomfortable and so then i started to think but wait a minute why and i realized how much business we were referring out to the west coast and then i thought well if i just get a license on the west coast then we can have an office there and maybe we can interview some people and get some agents and have a team there to have an expansion instead of just referring our business to another broker on a different team at a different firm we could be referring the business to our own team within the own firm because element has a footprint out there and once we did it there we realized that it was successful and then we did it down in miami and then we did it in texas and recently we did it in nevada and we went from two, three, four, five people to now what is almost 100 people wow. on the Eklund Gomes team. So Very impressive. Yeah. The Eklund Gomes team had a colossal year in 2021 with $4.5 in transactions and expanding across 12 different markets. Now, I know that you have to delegate because that's how you make money, but surely there's a need to also want to manage the, and sort of stay on top of everything. How do you have that stamina still? I'm very passionate about what I do, and I really consider myself so lucky, truly. I know it sounds cliche, but I really pinch myself yeah, because I'm sure. I'm, I am born to do this. I love what I do. Um, I come at things from a business perspective, right? So I get to use, you know, that side of my brain where I can work with the attorneys and the accountants and the financing end of our business. And at the same time, I get to be creative and I get to work with incredible you know, design and creative visionaries. To make something and, out of nothing. To make something out of nothing. In, a, in cities like New York and Miami and L.A. where we're literally building buildings that are redefining the skyline. It's just so epic. I'm never, ever going to lose sight at it. And the more that I do it, the better that I get and the more that I love it and the more that I want to do it. So that's when the stamina is just kind of built into the model itself. Because it's also the passion that drives it's just, it. It's really... Yep born in passion and I guess that's the stamina comes from passion love that you are gay biracial father of two you've overcome racism homophobia adversity which started in your youth to become the boss broker sitting in front of me today 
Could you tell me a little bit, please, about what you've taken away from those experiences and how it has shaped who you are today? Yeah, I never lose sight of it. And, um, you know, I'm incredibly fortunate to live the life that I live today. Um, I have two incredibly beautiful children. I have an amazing business partner and company. I have all these amazing people around me who help me do what I do. Um, my life is very different than what it was when I was growing up. Um, and I never, ever, ever lose sight of any of that. And I don't take any of it for granted. And I constantly just sit there and I remind myself. And sometimes I even open up um, a photo book of pictures of the little tiny house that I used to live in. Um, and I tell stories about my mom's, you know, used Pinto, which was a, you know, yes. ugly little car that she had because it's all that we could afford that really we couldn't because one day they came and the repo man took it away. Oh my so, gosh. and I remember that John. sound the eh, 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 of the thing going up. And, uh, or it could be like the phone ringing and like, oh, the bill collector. Like, I, I remember all of that. And I know, like, I remember one day we didn't have anything to eat. And my grandmother came to save the day, as she often did. And she literally took crab apples off of a table in the backyard and brought flour to make apple pancakes for dinner one night because my dad had lost his job and we were just like in a real pinch. So I just, I never, ever, ever forget that. And I'm, I'm very comfortable and fortunate living the life that I live. And at the same time, I rem I'm never gonna forget where I came from. Just, it's always gonna be who I am. I'm very real and very honest and very aware. While the industry has come a long way, there is plenty more to be done in the push for ex inclusivity. What steps do you think need to be taken in order to make a permanent positive impact and difference? Well, well, first of all, thank you for asking that question. And I will use that as part of the answer. Um, I think the steps that need to be taken are people like you asking people like me that question, right? Mm -hmm. We have to create more awareness and we have to make the issue more visible. Mm -hmm. um, people like myself, people like you, um, who get to hire people, right? We are always out there looking for like, who's the next person that I'm gonna bring on? And what's that, you know, team member gonna, who, what's that team member gonna be, who is that gonna be? And I think that we should really strongly start looking at the industry as a whole and just ask ourselves the question when we think about who should be on our team, we should be aware of who's not on the team, Bingo. if you will. And I think that we have the power. And, you know, Eklund Gomes has this platform now. And we're super aware of that. And we are charged and we are using our platform in many different ways. Uh, this month, we're introducing who we believe is the first transsexual. Amazing. Real estate broker. Awesome. I mean, have you ever sold an apartment or shown an apartment with someone no. who represent you know, who, no. who identifies with being trans? It's They've like, been undercover probably when they're showing it, to be honest. It's crazy, right? So <laughs> sad. we intentionally are bringing Jay's Cannon into the limelight. Number one, she's like an incredible woman who um, has great sales ability and really amazing at design and has a lot to offer. And at the same time, she is trans and there are no trans individuals. And we want to give that person a break. And not just for Jay's herself, but for all the others standard. that sure. will come after Jays mm -hmm. because they see Jays in that position. Same thing with, you know, black people. <laughs> There's just not enough black people in our industry. Let's just say it. And we're out there all the time. And at Eklund Golms, generally speaking, we don't hire people who don't have at least three to five years of experience. However, I do make an exception for people that are minorities that are not really in the industry and we need to bring more people in so that there is more of a visibility so that other people can recognize and see if that person can do it i can do you know how many people say to me because they think my last name is gomez right so they think that i'm latin you know mm -hmm. and i get so many emails on a regular basis from people saying thank you I'm so inspired by your story, and because you're doing what you do, it makes me believe that I can do that too. And it is like so heartwarming and gut-wrenching at the same time, and so incredibly beautiful. Yeah. But it's I'm mindful of that when I think about you know how we change the landscape and make this industry more inclusive. Here, here. 
What would you say is the biggest achievement or win in your career and what deal has meant the most to you? Oh gosh, um, there have been so many, it's hard to pick one. Um, but I guess one that sticks out is early in my career, I had a listing on Stone Street, number 54 Stone Street. Can you believe, like, all that's almost 20 years. <laughs> and we I remember, remember it this. like yesterday. But it was 54 uh, no. Stone Street. It was almost like an unsellable apartment. I don't even know if it actually ever sold. But one day <laughs> in the cold winter, um, this small person walked in very short this guy well he was like because it was he, he was so short that i was like wow he's really short um and but he had this hat on and i couldn't really see who he was and he was like all covered up in his coat and then i thought to myself like who just walked in you know i didn't know i was like a little bit scared sometimes you don't know like who's walking into Believe the apartment me. right yes. and um, as it turns out the guy didn't buy the apartment however he became my new buyer and he ended up buying uh, he was interested in the Visionaire, which was 70 Little that. West 12. And so there were two penthouses on the top. And this guy, so unassuming, that came in that I was a little bit afraid of, decided that he wanted to buy one of those penthouses. And while we were up there, um, he s we saw the other penthouse. And he couldn't decide between the two. So I just looked at him and I said, oh, wow, can wow. you imagine wow. what the two of them would look like? together combining so i planted that seed just kind of as a trial balloon stop it and he looked at me and stop he said it. he looked because it was brand new it wasn't even on the market i knew the agent that was selling it and she was doing me a favor basically and because i hounded her and so then he looked at me and said oh <laughs> but they would never let me buy it meaning the other one and i looked at him and i winked and i said let me take care of that <laughs> I went into, <laughs> anyway, as you can see, it was, it, I mean, that literally. Is, that is a moment we in put, your career. We put the two of them together. Of course you did. And we did this big deal. It was a 4% commission. Oh, totally crazy. My. And I still can't believe that. It was, I Don't think, $6 million each. Mm -hmm. So it was $12, 12 million times 4%. 4%. Thank you so much. It was much. a half a million dollar commission. Yeah. I, like, couldn't even wrap my head around that. Wow. What was even crazier and why this is such a memorable moment for me is that that was the same day that I had that meeting with Sean Osher, who was going to make it. me a star. Wow. And so I went to my office manager. I was at Douglas Elliman at the time, because where I began my career, before I moved to CORE for two years and then came back. back to but so they all come back, you know. I went yeah. to my manager at the time, and I gave him my resignation. Oh. And I told him that I was going to another firm, and I also gave him my commission slip <laughs> for this new. And he was awfully confused because he couldn't understand how I could be pushing a half a million dollar commission slip in front of him and also giving him notice. He said, I don't think you understand, John. Um, there's a policy <laughs> when you leave, you lose 40% lose, or 50%. Actually, it was 50%. Right? You lose 50% of your commission. So suddenly the 500 went, went down to, to 250. 250. Right. But it was going to be two and a half years before the building was built. And I knew that Sean Osher was going to make me a star. Stop. So I had so much more in my mind to make in that two and a half year period that I could give him that money. What I didn't know, by the way, at the time is that that night later on, he called me and he said, what's your address? And I gave him the address. He said, oh, because we're putting everything in, uh, in your desk in a box and we're sending it to you. I was like, what? You're putting all my belongings in a box? I, but I gave you my notice thinking I did the right thing by giving them two weeks. But that's not how it works in the they real estate business. Down. They close it down. <laughs> At that moment in my mind, because I'm, I'm very inspired by music, I got that Beyonce song that came in. To the left, to the left, everything you own in the box to the left. I wow. thought they're sending my stuff down in a box. Well, the next line of that song goes... You must not know about me. You must not know about me. <laughs> so I was very fired up about that. And it like propelled me forward and into the future. And in many ways, I have to thank him because that really kind of got me going. And then from there, I never looked back. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's why it's one of my like favorite deals. <laughs> that is <laughs> Long one story. Hell Sorry for that. Win. No, it's great. <laughs> While there are many wins, there are inevitable misses tell me about a time you missed out on a big deal and what you did to bounce back look there are 
too many misses to <laughs> so many. even remember. And the truth is, is that I'm that type of person yeah. who tends to forget. Um, I don't you dwell shake it off in the like negative. I do. You have to. I just shake it off. Because we lose more than we make anyway. If you don't play, you can't win. So if you play a lot, then you're going to lose more often than what most lose. But if you dwell on the negative, then you're going to stay in this really dark, bitter, bitter yeah. negative mm-hmm. place. And everything is going to just spin out of control and it's just going to be bad. So I just let go of it. If one thing I do think, and I do always think, and this is that, um, I call it my Julia Roberts moment, um, <laughs> that movie with Richard Gere, Pretty Woman. Remember that Which scene? scene? When she walked into the Beverly Hills store where the girls wouldn't oh, and they give wouldn't her, serve her. And she yes. had that dress on. It yes, was, I think, a brown blue. dress with, like, polka dots. Oh, yes. And she said, mistake. Big, big mistake. mistake. Huge. Huge. So anytime I don't get a job, it's my own <laughs> personal thing. It's crazy, but it's true. I say that. Big mistake. Huge. Huge. And I move on. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. Okay. All right. Now, everyone's going to be wanting this. What are your top tips to finding the right people to grow and achieve success within this business? Yeah. You know, I am fortunate to be put in front of new people that are looking to come into the industry all the time. Um, I get to meet lots of people. I get to meet people who have great experience and so on and so forth. When I sit down to meet someone, I never sit down at a conference table setting. I always meet someone in a comfortable setting somewhere, a sofa in my office or um, a coffee shop or something. And the first thing that I ask that person is, to tell me their life story. I'm interested in learning who you are and what makes you tick and why do you tick that way? Where did you come from? Where were you born? What were your pack? A lot of the questions that you asked me, I'm very interested in learning because what's interesting to me is not always what What they say. say. It's what they don't say. It's what they don't say and it's how they They say. say. That's the sell right there. Do you see what I mean? It's like how they say tells me so much. I'm very intuitive so I feel things very quickly Mm -hmm. and I'm just super aware of everything. All the nonverbal cues, all of it. That's and the I'm, survivor. That's what right and that's the survivor. Mm-hmm. And I pick up on all of that. And that's what leads me to the next question. And sometimes that leads me to end the conversation. Got it. Well said. That was brilliant. Okay, so if you could live at any of the projects you've worked on over the years, which one would you choose and why? Gosh. I do live in one of the projects that I (laughs) worked on, and I love my home. Um, However, I think that there's one very special building for me that stands out, and for many different reasons. Um, Bleaker. It's Bleaker. I knew it. I could tell. But number 36, not 40. No, I know. The Schumacher. Yeah, because I went in there when you were wearing a hard hat, and you were literally like Marcel Marceau, busy showing me in visual (laughs) without anything to show me. And I have never seen anyone work so hard to convey a magical experience with nothing. I thought, my gosh. He wants this. And it's I loved such a it. beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. This, the the story of that building, the condition that it was in when the developer <laughs> bought it. I mean, never it was it. storing all these records and like you know paper and you know files and shelves and the windows were uh, you know covered up with plywood and you couldn't see anything. Um, everything was just so dark and dusty and gross and it was just bad. And, and then the jewel. And it was a fun. jewel. I like, know. we learned so many Ceiling. things. The barrel vaulted ceilings barrel. and the beautiful brick Hi. facade, the restoration, the love that the, the developer poured into it, and the product that it became in the end. I mean, it's a great location and a beautiful building, and it just... It's just... It was epic, and it's one of my favorites. It is one of those beautiful, rare projects, one of a kind. What are some of the personal habits you have to keep you at the top of your game? Mm, interesting. 
Well, I guess I wake up really early in the morning. Um, I wake up at 5.30 every day. And I Me wake too. up at 5.30 Tired. and I spend the first 30 minutes in bed. Uh, because I'm reviewing all of my... I go to bed very early. Um, I put my kids in bed at 8 and I go to bed right after that, truthfully yeah. speaking. Yeah. Uh, so I wake up early in the morning. I read my emails from 5.30 until 6. I then go to the gym from 6 until 7 and come back and wake my kids up at 7. So getting ahead of How do you of get the... your kids to sleep in? Oh, they're like... Honey, no. <laughs> it's amazing to me. I had this amazing baby nurse that taught them how to sleep from 7 to 7. And now they go to bed at 8, but they still wake up at 7. Okay, keep going. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that I do at the end of the day, and this is very important, is that, you know, we're inundated with so many emails so uh -huh. many text messages there's so much happening that it's inevitable that you're going to miss one and you know you don't want to miss the, the one, one. <laughs> so, and that's starting to happen i'm like no no it can't happen so what i do at the end of the day and frederick taught me this at the end of the day i sit there i shut my door i take another 30 minutes and i scroll from the very first one that i responded to at 5 30 a.m all the way back to the most current one and that's kind of how i stay on top of my game uh huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not if easy. You, no, sure. If you weren't in real estate, what would you be doing? If I were not in real estate, what would I be doing? You know, if I were not in real estate, I would probably be doing what I'm going to do when I retire from real estate. Here it is. I am going to be an innkeeper. I love that. That's so gorgeous. I love cooking. Where? Uh, you know, probably somewhere in New England. That's where I'm from. Get I think it's one out. of the most beautiful places. It has four seasons. Total 360. I love Back to both. <laughs> old <laughs> buildings and historical homes. And I have this dream of buying a big old property and converting it into sort of a bed and breakfast and working your maitre d skills, work, your business skills, I love your to real cook. it's brilliant. I, lo I love to cook. <laughs> Um, I love entertaining. What's your dish? Oh, God, there are so many of them. Okay, so you're like me. You like to cook, cook. I love to cook, cook. cook. I've got, like, you can't even imagine. I can't even count how many cookbooks I've got. And I'm just constantly flipping through them and trying new recipes all the time. Love that. I love yeah. that you eat. Um, you don't look like you do. Um, <laughs> okay, so what's the final question? What's your biggest vice? Gosh, my biggest vice, um, well, I don't drink alcohol, I don't smoke, I don't do drugs. I feel like those are like the typical vices that people have. I love sugar. <laughs> I am like, uh, honestly, it's it's my thing. It's just like, it's, really? it, I, it's like I've, I've come to terms and I am, <laughs> you know, I admit uh, I'm not in denial. I am a sugar addict. It's true. And what's it, in what form? Oh, any form. Give me a cake. <laughs> me give me cookies. Give me cupcakes. And by the way, having these kids, <laughs> almost five Forget years old, it. it is the best excuse. It's like, oh, let me go get them something. <laughs> you know? I mean, but truly, I mean, a, a big slice of cake or a brownie, or and we're always making things at home too. So, yeah, I would say sugar is for sure my my biggest vice. I really, really am impressed that you own that one. I, I do. Most people are closeted about their sugar Oh, I'm, I'm owning it. I'm out well, there. Well done. I want to thank you for taking a slice, literally, out of your day and sitting here and getting real with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for being here today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's my pleasure.